suspension cell culturing during cell therapy workflow. Uh, with this, we would like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Atalai Tok. Um, Dr. Atalai Tok is actually a, a molecular biologist trained and he has a lot of experience in the research uh, aspect of it. And with this, he actually holds a PhD degree from Heidelberg University. He is our application specialist for the centrifuge and his station out of Germany. And uh, today for this for this seminar, we have uh, beside me, we have Jeffrey Poon as a panelist as well. So during the seminar, I would uh, encourage everybody to ask questions. Uh, you can key in your questions on the Q&A chat box below uh, on, your, on your screen. And uh, I would suggest that uh, all participants to put their speaker on mute and also to uh, off their video so that it will not be a distraction. So with that said, uh, oh yes, uh, I've forgotten. Uh, my apologies. We have another important panelist which I would like to recommend all of you, and that is Romana Hills. Uh, Romana is actually our application specialist as well from Centrifuge, and she has been with us with uh, many years and she has many years of experience as well in centrifugation. She is also based out from Germany. So without further ado, uh, I will leave this time, uh, give it over to Dr. Top. If he has anything more, he wants to introduce himself to the audience. Otherwise, uh, we will we'll give him the control over this time for him to, pre to start his presentation. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Atalai Tok. Thank you very much, Anita, uh, for this nice introduction. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm actually quickly uh, turn off my video, not to distract you, so you can all focus on the slides instead of me. Um, am I, I am going to talk about the role of centrifugation in the cell therapy workflow, and while doing so, I'm going to try to attract your attention to some points that are either very easily overlooked or simply unknown to many research out there. Let me start with showing the outline of my talk. Some of these points overlap with each other to some extent. However, for the sake of this talk, I collected the information under the most relevant titles so that I believe it's going to help putting things into context. First of all, I'm going to start with sharing some statistics from the regenerative marketplace to get a better understanding of the recent, recent state of the market. Secondly, I will describe how centrifugation actually fits in the typical cell therapy workflow. And then I'm going to continue with some general tips to improve cell culture centrifugation. Positioning of centrifuges um, in cell therapy suites or cell culture laboratories also doesn't receive the thought process it requires. So I'm going to share with you some insight on what should be avoided and what should be taken into consideration. And then I'm going to continue with giving some considerations that you can benefit from in order to improve your cell palating in an efficient way. In the last part, I'm going to address how to maintain reproducibility um, while taking preventative measures against contamination. And at the end of my talk, I'm going to mention a few features with which a centrifuge can actually help you comply with the uh, ever-changing regulations and strict requirements that cell therapy developers need to address. Oops. All right. Let's get started. So here's some data summarizing the cell therapy market scene. Either you already, I assume, made the transition from the bench to manufacturing, or you are planning on the next steps to bring your research into the translational stage. These numbers are, I think, important to know. 
as of the third quarter of 2020, uh, as you can see, more than half of the ongoing regenerative medicine trials are actually cell-based therapies. The second place belongs to the gene therapy. And then the third place is held by the tissue-based therapies. Um, a significant number of these studies are in the phase one currently, and even a higher number of trials are ongoing in phase two. The number of studies that have reached to the phase three is almost 100. Again, half of these phase three trials are about the um, cell-based therapies. In total, worldwide, we are actually looking at a picture of 1,109 clinical trials that are currently ongoing uh, in regenerative medicine. Now let's have a look at how many regenerative medicine developers out there and how they are dispersed around the globe. Um, there are more than 1,000 active developers currently. Most of them are found in North America and in Europe. In the Asia Pacific region, the number of active developers are currently more than 200. Um, now that we had a brief look into the regenerative medicine market, um, let's see what kind of a role uh, centrifugation plays in the typical cell therapy workflow. So this is a typical cell therapy workflow. It basically has two main segments. The first part is the upstream part, and it entails all the steps from the cell source um, to cell isolation and cell culture and expansion. Scaling up or out or the genetic modifications is also performed in this part. The downstream segments involve um, harvesting, preservation, storage, and release of the end product. One could also add administration or introduction into the patient in this step. Now, regarding our talk today, the question is where in this workflow can centrifuges be of use? So centrifuges can actually play a role among the cell isolation, cell expansion and harvesting steps. Now I'd like to give you a closer look at these steps to show you how different roles centrifugation can play in each of these steps. Um, for instance, during cell isolation, different methods are selected dependent on the cell type of interest. There are methods like plastic adhesion, which can be used to isolate mesenchymal cells, which have an affinity towards plastic surfaces if um, specific markers are known to be found on the surface of the target cells. These can also be utilized to isolate cells by using uh, flow cytometry applications. Um, when size and weight selection is the preferred method, of course, centrifugation becomes the method of choice for a variety of cell types. Density gradients to get mononuclear cells from peripheral or cord blood or bone marrow is one of the most common applications of centrifuges during cell isolation. I'm going to actually come back to this point to mononuclear cell isolation later in my talk to share with you some important tips. Another step during the cell therapy workflow where centrifuges can be used is the cell, ex cell culture expansion step. So basically, the purpose of this step is to uh, increase the amount of cells that we have. So cells are palleted and then dissolved in fresh media and distributed into fresh containers. In this step, uh, we also get rid of metabolic waste byproducts and cell debris. Um, the important thing about the cell culture practice is that when 
fell behind the um, subculturing schedule for adherent cells, for instance, contact inhibition can start or too high confluency in suspension cell cultures can actually cause cell stress. Um, that's important to avoid because when that happens, it takes a certain amount of time for the cells to reach or regain their desired growth rate again and to show wild type characteristics or behavior. In order to ensure meaningful results from the experiments or having for having reproducible results, timely cell culturing or subculturing practice is key. Um, going further, the next step where centrifugation is pronounced the most in the cell perfect workflow is harvesting. Uh, in this step, the main purpose is to concentrate cells by pelleting. At the same time, of course, excess growth media and serum is gotten rid of. One needs to pay attention to resuspend the cell pellets as quick as possible so that unnecessary stress is prevented on cells. Now, I would like to put what I've shared with you um, into a more solid context by taking a conventional CAR T cell therapy workflow as an example. So, oops. So T cells are isolated from patient's blood in order to do so, leukophoresis, which is basically a centrifugation method, is commonly applied. However, this can also be achieved in a batch centrifuge as well. Um, isolated T cells are then activated. Activated T cells are then genetically modified to express specific chimeric antigen receptors, either with lentiviral systems or CRISPR-Cas9, and the CAR T cells then expanded ex vivo, where centrifuges are again of use repeatedly. So lastly, the cells are harvested and prepared for the retransfusion, as in the case of autologous treatments, or transfusion, as it is in the case of allogenic cell therapies. Harvesting is basically the last step of the cell therapy workflow, well, where centrifugation has a very pronounced use. So far, we have seen how centrifuge fits in the general scheme. However, it's also important to know that some of the other main instruments of the cell therapy workflow also help greatly in this workflow. I will now show you briefly how centrifuges uh, interact with other laboratory devices. So, Starting from cardio-preserved samples, which are first taught, and cell cultures started. Subculturing um, treatment of the cultures are performed in biosafety cabinets, and expansion is achieved in carbon dioxide incubators or carbon dioxide resistant shakers. In order to prevent any unwanted results for your purposes, uh, you must make sure that every element of the workflow functions error-proof and functions in harmony. This, of course, requires a certain level of innovative interface where the single elements match with each other in technological levels in order to have a certain performance in a standardized manner. So far, we have covered the potential uses of centrifugation in cell therapy workflow and interaction of centrifuges with the other main elements of the workflow. Now, let's have a look at some facts and tips that are useful for cell culture centrifugation. So, as a rule of thumb, one should, uh, what one should keep in mind all the time throughout the cell therapy workflow that mammalian cells are very, very delicate. In some cases, such a fact is easily overlooked by the researcher and the yield suffers unnecessarily. Um, it only becomes a problem, unfortunately, once the yield decreases to noticeable levels. In line with the delicate uh, nature of these mammalian cells, um, most 
mammalian cells or all mammalian cells, I can say, are centrifuged at really low G forces, ranging typically from 100 times G to 500 times G. While higher G values will cause cell damage, applying very, very low G levels can also in turn reduce viability because the cells will be spending way too much time outside the incubator. So here there's a trade-off. And this might then cause diminished growth rates. And as I said earlier, it's going to take a certain amount of time uh, for the cells until they regain their proliferative characteristics, which can have drastic effects on the therapy production pipeline. Therefore, having a complete control of G4 settings are key. And we recommend choosing a centrifuge unit, which is designed to fine tune your protocol with increments as small as five times G. This is certainly required to have the best optimal centrifugation conditions for your cells and guarantee reproducibility for successful outcomes. I also would like to share with you what other biological particles requires as for RCF values. Um, we refer to such values when applying different protocols as researchers, but it's helpful to, I think, have a look at them all together at once. This will, I hope, uh, put the requirements for cell culture centrifugation into a better context by comparing it to other biological particles. So at the far right-hand side, we do have small proteins and plasmids, small viruses and nanoparticles that usually require application of hundreds of thousands of G. Larger viruses, lipoproteins, and organelles, together with large proteins and um, micromolecules, are found on the left-hand side of the RCF range. At the lower end of the scale chart, there are whole cells that, as I said before, which require very low RCF values to ensure um, efficient separation while maintaining cell viability. To give you an example, also I would like to now share with you some specific RCF requirements for some mammalian and insect cell lines. And these cell lines are commonly used for uh, vaccine production from CHO to human embryonic um, cell lines, viral cells, suspension adapt or not, MDCK, and mostly used insect cell lines, S2 and SF9. Uh, as you can see, mammalian cells um, do require low RCF values. However, insect cells, they are shown to actually um, endure higher times G forces, in most cases in the range of 500 to 1,000. Before we proceed any further, I think it is critical to identify what one wants to get out of a centrifugation process. First thing is efficiency. Centrifugation should guarantee optimal separation for your product of interest a simplified process which can be performed easily without cumbersome preparation and operation methods, and of course, minimize risk of contamination as the samples are the most valuable part of your experimental workflow. And in the case of a contamination, um, you might need to spend very lengthy procedures to, to get rid of it. Going on, um, cell viability. Um, this is actually a natural um, outcome of efficient centrifugation by applying necessary G forces and avoiding shear stress. Cells do maintain their uh, proliferation characteristics um, so that you can supply the downstream applications basically in an uninterrupted way. Down the scheme, we have yield. Uh, we, an experimenter can, of course, secure the yield by benefiting from the uh, flexibility that a centrifuge can provide. 
by scaling up, for instance, for allergenic studies or scaling out when you're focusing on autologous studies, you can achieve your desired yield. But as a rule of thumb, it's necessary to take actions to minimize cell loss by optimizing your protocol and choosing the right instruments to run your protocol. Uh, now I can already hear you asking, it's only natural, um, whether there are not or there are other methods to do so. The answer is yes. Centrifugation is, of course, not the only method that's used. However, um, it's independent of many of the factors below, and here's why we recommend it. So it's independent of limited cell specificity. It can be a method of choice when high cell densities are desired. And with a centrifuge, you can control and maintain temperature. And normally, batch centrifugation is not affected by exceeding shearing forces. So altogether, this is going to, I relate back to the previous slide where efficiency, cell viability, and yield is all uh, interconnected. Having said that, I think it's a good time to now start with some tips and considerations that can be rather difficult to come by for getting what you aim for. Honestly speaking, I didn't know a lot of these top points uh, that I'm going to share now uh, during my previous research positions, and I hope you will also find them helpful for your own work. Let's start with positioning of centrifuges in cell therapy or cell culture suites. As much as it gets... Um, so, okay, let's start with laboratory space. We all know that uh, it is even more competitive nowadays to receive research grants, but the same applies to laboratory space. Um, for one thing, lab space is valuable, and therefore you must make sure to make good use of it, and you need to have a strategy when positioning your lab instruments. Um, so centrifuges are devices that can produce tens of thousands of G-force. Um, and they will inevitably vibrate. Um, therefore, can interfere with other fine laboratory instruments. No need to say one such instrument is microscopes, and this is this was pretty much what I knew before, uh, not to put the centrifuge next to a microscope. However, there is more to it. Let me share now these two scenarios with you. Um, in one setup, by a safety cabinet, carbon dioxide incubator and centrifuge are located far away from each other. In the second scenario, the centrifuge um, is kept closely placed with the other two main elements of the SATEC workflow. And I would like to direct this question to you now. Uh, which positioning you find uh, as the better option? Please, by using the chat function, write one for the setup on the left-hand side or two for the setup on the right-hand side. I'm very curious. Okay, I see one, one vote for the option one. Okay, so, okay, I see one, one, two, so it's 50 50 so far. Another one. I'm going to give you an unorthodox answer, and I'm going to say that the answer is actually the uh, second option. So the first scenario would require a lot more personal movement in the lab, and it can lift up aerosols or dust particles from the lab floor, and it can cause them circulate in the lab air that can be a potential risk factor for your sample. For that reason, in order to have minimized personal movement, um, when you have the chance, you should go for the option two. 
this is not only going to ensure uh, increased efficiency, but it's also going to help mitigate potential contamination risks. One possible alternative and a very flexible solution to prevent unnecessary movement in cell therapy suites would be using centrifuges with uh, lockable casters and position the centrifuge wherever they are needed. In the crowded conditions of many cell culture suits, these floor standing centrifuges on rollers basically can provide excellent adaptability. So, in contrast to what I have suggested in the previous slide, um, and I've seen two uh, attendees voting for the option one, you are right, also centrifuges are known to typically kept away from or safe to cabinets because they can produce large number of aerosols during runs. Um, my colleagues did an internal validation and tested this idea whether our centrifuges would breach the air barrier that our biosafety cabinets form, and the results were more than satisfactory, so the air barrier was not breached by the running centrifuge. This, of course, increases your flexibility even more, so by safely placing the centrifuge near a biosafety cabinet, the researcher can access the centrifuge basically uh, without even getting up from the lab stool at the same time, it gives the ability to monitor the runtime easily. And what I'm really trying to emphasize here is that choosing the right equipment as in other, any other application can already stop a lot of potential issues um, from becoming troubling problems in the future and gives you room for improvement in the workflow. As I briefly mentioned before, so centrifuges inevitably cause vibration, and they shouldn't be placed on the same bench as microscopes or other fine instruments. But the question is what you can do about it. So centrifuges, as I said, um, with rollers or with casters can be a good, good solution to this problem, or one can also utilize uh, separate bench modules and place the centrifuges on them so that they don't have a physical connection to the fine instrument um, by sharing the same bench space. So we have covered some important considerations on where to place centrifuges. As I said, I didn't know about them during my researchership positions. Um, I hope they were also helpful to you. Let's now continue with some important tips to improve cell palleting. Okay, so I would like to now raise the second question to you. Um, we already covered that gentle centrifugation was essential for mammalian cell cultures, but what about the rotor type you would choose in this case? A fixed angle rotor or a swinging back rotor? Please, um, like before, write one for the fixed angle option on the left-hand side or two for the option saving bucket type into the chat. Okay. I know this, this was a very trivial question, and I, know I get one option two, another one. Thank you very much. Yes, the correct answer is indeed a uh, swing bucket, and here is why. So for one thing, use of swing bucket rotors uh, rather than fixed angle rotors will provide pallet at the bottom of the tubes in a rather um, homogeneous and even manner. However, with the fixed angle rotors, uh, cells will actually start uh, palleting on the side of the wall, and during centrifugation process, they will somehow uh, slide down the tube and accumulate at the bottom. As you can imagine, this can easily damage the mammalian cells and decrease the yield drastically. Um, one tip that I had no idea about during my research years was the fact that the choice of tube location um, will also make a difference. So different tube slots make a different angle 
to the rotation axis. Um, long story short, the center tubes are almost perfectly in line with the rotation axis, while the neighboring tubes receive centrifugal force with a small angle, and therefore the palleting won't be as even. Um, so in order to get the most even pallets, uh, you need to utilize the central slots. But this is if your yield is very, very low and um, depends on your needs. If you are running, for instance, a small number of um, tubes in a centrifugation run, then I would say uh, just place your tubes into the middle because those uh, slots will give you the best um, pallet, most even pallets. As I already mentioned earlier, so gradients are sometimes used, uh, especially for isolating mononuclear cells from either uh, peripheral blood or cord blood or bone marrow. Uh, in order to increase the throughput, one can plan to use larger tubes. However, this may not help with the yield as the interfaces of these gradients are very delicate and they can easily be disrupted and cell loss can occur. Um, in larger tubes especially, this can happen even more readily due to the fact that the interface is also larger. Therefore, our suggestion is uh, using thinner tubes, for instance, using uh, 50 ml conical tubes instead of um, 15 ml conical tubes instead of 50 ml conical tubes. And then uh, when you are doing density gradient centrifugation, uh, with your cell culture samples. As easy as the chemical gradient layers can disrupt, uh, it also holds true for the pellets. Until the rotor is completely stopped, the samples are retrieved from the centrifuge. The run is basically not over. So the last step of centrifugation, which is the breaking step, can actually cause a lot of problems by disrupting nicely formed cell pellets. As a rule of thumb, faster breaking usually correlates more with pellet disruption. During breaking, a movement will occur in the, within the supernatant due to the so-called uh, Coriolis forces, and this movement is greater than under fast breaking, and it is this mo movement in the liquid that will release the cells from the surface of the pellet and disrupt the pellet so that you are going to use your sample. I want to now continue with showing you a deceleration profile. And this is from a specific rotor and centrifuge combination. As um, rotor, so this is important to, to mention, rotor and centrifuge capabilities vary a lot among different manufacturers. So there is no standard when it comes to acceleration and deceleration profiles. Um, asking for deceleration profiles from your centrifuge manufacturer will basically help you find a suitable setting parameter for your application. Therefore, uh, you need to, or as a rule of thumb, you need to select a braking profile that is slow enough to have no effect on your pallet, but quick enough to reduce the time that the time out of the incubator and your cells can maintain their viability better. In conventional centrifuges, the load on the rotor also has a large effect on the braking efficiency. As an example, what you see here is um, a loaded rotor, which is shown with this red line here, and an empty rotor, which is shown with this blue line here. Um, this graph shows you basically how much time difference uh, both scenarios have until the rotor comes to a full stop. It is about uh, one and a half time more for the loaded configuration. So like in everything else, new technologies allow you to protect your samples even more. And we suggest that you can actually overcome such a variability by um, using a centrifuge that basically utilizes a microprocessor controlled braking. In such a setup, the centrifuge will basically 
automatically adjust the braking power constantly to achieve reproducible brakes run after run without being affected by the different uh, sample loads. Another thing that's important to mention about deceleration is that at different speeds, deceleration is also affected very differently. At higher RCF values, uh, where the bucket orientation is horizontal, effect of braking is going to be minor. At lower speeds, however, braking is going to have a more pronounced impact uh, on deceleration due to RCF values and reorienting of the buckets. Excuse me. Okay, so, oops. So, um, already related to some of the earlier topics, uh, but reproducibility is an impact factor that must be assured. One main feature of a centrifuge uh, that can help you get more reproducible results is choosing basically refrigeration, while for some applications, room temperature um, doesn't present itself as a risk factor, but for most applications, it does. In addition, one should keep in mind that uh, ventilated centrifuges can heat up to very high temperatures that can risk your experimental success. Um, so factors like how many centrifuges are found in the laboratory, how often and how long a centrifuge is used, uh, especially in the case of ventilated centrifuges, are actually uh, very important factors that can cause um, high temperatures. With a refrigerated uh, centrifuge, however, you will have the tools to minimize and control such uh, temperature raise. Another point that deserves attention is basically the variety of sample loads at every run. Um, so in order to secure consistent results, we cannot always have the same sample load in each run. What I mean is that in a perfect world, you would have the same number of cubes with the with, uh, same sample volume. However, this is not always the case. Um, when a rotor is partially or fully loaded and the weight difference lead to different acceleration, can lead to different acceleration rate. Here is on this graph, we can observe this phenomenon. In one scenario, the rotor is loaded with two bottles and in another one with six bottles, while the rotor with two bottles will reach the target speed um, a lot faster six bottle loaded configuration reach the same speed after some time. So this difference in time is highlighted in blue in color in this graph. Therefore, the duration that these samples are going to uh, spend at the target speed will differ. And as a result, the pelleting efficiency uh, will be different. But for maintaining a certain level of performance, however, you can choose a centrifuge that automatically adjusts the run power uh, by basically weighing the sample load itself. This way, it's going to run a little bit more than um, uh, the rotor took a longer time to reach the target speed, so that you can expect to have a consistent result from your centrifugation runs with uh, varying sample loads. As in most biology applications, um, and especially for cell culture rooms, contamination is a big problem sometimes. Um, we have the tools, however, to prevent it or to minimize the risk of it. I already touched upon this uh, while sharing some tips on positioning and centrifuge in cell culture room with regards to risks of uh, aerosols uh, that are produced during centrifugation. Um, but we need to have a closer look at the contribution of a centrifuge to, the, to this risk. So basically, refrigerated and ventilated units circulate a certain amount of air when cooling down. Uh, this is even more pronounced for ventilated units as um, they use air as medium to cool down uh, operating temperatures. So this air movement can lift up any contaminant around 
and underneath the centrifuge and disperse it in the room. Therefore, good cleaning practices are key to prevent such unwanted scenarios. So, in theory, cleaning is a common step or a universal step shared by any biology experiment. However, in practice, there's always a lot of room for improvement. Uh, in the laboratory that I've been to so far, I've noticed that setting up schedules and plans were almost always done perfectly, but as the time passes, holidays interfere, experiments pile up, you need to produce data. So the first thing that you basically stop doing or that starts lagging will be the cleaning procedures, especially in psychology suits, this would be unacceptable. So our recommendation is also choosing a centrifuge that can accommodate easy to remove um, rotors uh, without a need of any kind of specialized tools. So this is going to ensure quick access to the centrifuge bowl and therefore cleaning will be performed easier and cleaning practices will be followed better by the personnel. Another tip that's, going, that's worth sharing is to make sure that there is no spillage on the outside of the tube, uh, tube walls and no liquid gets captured in the bottle threads because these might leak into the buckets and in the centrifuge bowl and, and act as a potential contaminant, uh, risking other, other applications. There are also other tools that you can benefit from in your daily workflow. One such feature is the so-called biocontainment lids. Um, these lids provide an airtight sealing over your samples. This way, you not only protect your samples in the centrifuges, but you can also capture possible contaminants from leaking out of the bucket. Our recommendation is to choose by containment lids uh, that allows single-handed operation so that your workflow is going to remain even more efficient. Okay, so here is another question, but I'm going to address this to myself on your behalf. Um, when was the last time you looked under your centrifuge? This is actually a very good question to address. Um, my experience was so far once or twice a year at best when we were doing some seasonal cleaning in the lab. Such um, secluded and hidden places over time start hosting a bunch of lost parts, uh, used tips, tubes, and so on. But I understand the unwillingness to clean such areas regularly because a regular uh, benchtop centrifuge can weigh up to 150 kilograms. Um, so this is where I'm going to suggest that the solution again for standing centrifuges can be uh, preferable by simply unlocking the casters and moving the centrifuge. Uh, one can easily reach underneath uh, for cleaning purposes. Okay, so lastly, I would like to finish my talk by saying a few words on uh, how centrifuges can help with compliance to regulations and standards. And we all know that cell therapy applications are rightfully very tightly regulated. Uh, recording data and the ability of presenting it at every step of your workflow is key. So choosing centrifuges that allows extended controlling, such as a real-time run monitoring, or password protect access and tracking of rotor centrifuge studies is recommended. Documentation is not of, of utmost importance. Centrifuges with data logging and collection software capabilities will help ensure staying compliant to good manufacturing and laboratory practices. Also, please make sure that your centrifuge is designed in a way that it is up to date with the most recent uh, global standards and certifications to ensure uh, compliance. In conclusion, um, I hope that you are going to leave the talk today with a better understanding of how a centrifuge in satire pursuit um, um, can help you get the results that you aim for, what difference it makes if it is positioned uh, close to the biosafety covenant and not, um, 
what strategies you actually have to implement um, to improve sub palettes, uh, how one can improve reproducibility through use of refrigeration, or in in general, how one can reduce contamination risks through centrifuge selection and positioning. Having said that, um, also, if you want to have more information, you can always email me. You can see this underneath the slide here in the in the footer. You can also visit thermofisher.com to read several application notes, white papers, and guidelines for your applications. And I would like to thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, to all the audience, if you have questions, you can now type your questions into the chat box. Yeah, and uh, Atalai and Romana, we will all be here to answer your questions. 